The Psalms are a well-worn collection of songs, hymns, and prayers that speak to the human experience. Life is not a level path. In this world, we will experience joy, sorrow, anger, shame, love, jealousy, hope, and more. Emotions are a gift and a part of our God-given design. But how do we direct these emotions and keep our eyes fixed on God in the highs and lows of life? King David authored many psalms, and we will learn how to steward our lives well in the highest highs and the lowest lows as we study through some of his greatest hits. This morning we're continuing in our um, our look at the Psalms, and we're going to be in Psalm 62. So you can turn there. There's Bibles in front of you. If you don't have one, you can grab hold of that. Um, but as you're turning there, would you stand with me? I'm going to invite Sammy to come on up. She's going to read for us from Psalm 62 this morning. All right, Psalm 62, to the choir master, according to Jeduthun, a Psalm of David. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him, like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. You may be seated. Just want to say you're welcome. For some of you, that's the most silence you've had all week, or maybe in a longer time than that. Um, I, I wrote in my notes to see how long I could take that, and I'll just tell you, I got more uncomfortable with it than you did. Um, I was like, I don't know if I can do this for very much longer. And then I was like, do I just sit here, like, stare at you all? But that would get weird, and I didn't want to start weird, but we already have. Here we are. There are very few spaces in our life where we can experience uh, silence. But even more than that, when we actually get a hold of that space that we call quiet, uh, we can often find that uh, the person that we talk to the most becomes really noisy in the silence, and, and that's ourselves. The noise that comes from us, the conversations that we have in our heads when we are left on our own are not always the most helpful. And so when we we pause and we stop and we sit in silence, sometimes it can start to feel like urgent, like we're wasting time because our pace is so hurried and there's so many things to get done. How could I just possibly sit here? And so we, we seek in all moments when we have a gap in time to, to fill it as best we can. And sometimes that's just filling it with noise, whether it's just turning on the radio, listening to talk radio or a, another podcast or an audible book, because we're trying to make the most use of our time. But there's always just kind of this noise that's hovering in the background. And for some of us, we, we feel like if we, if we could just get 
those couple things done, well, then maybe, just maybe, then we could enjoy some rest. And that rest always seems to be just a couple more things away as we're constantly pursuing this, trying to find when we can just breathe for a little bit, but instead we feel constantly under pressure under pressure of others, under pressure of ourselves and the expectations that we have for ourselves. And here, in this moment, as David is writing Psalm 62, he is a man, he is a king who is under pressure. There is people trying to take his kingdom from him. They're pressing in on him from all angles. And what is his response in this moment when he feels the pressure of life? What does he do? Well, he stops and he pauses for just a moment to aim himself towards God. This is not herbal tea. I have not started some new fad diet. This is not a sample for any medical purposes. Uh, <laughs> this is just some water. And, and if you're close enough to it, you can see it's got some floaties in it, but it's somewhat clear. But what I always find fascinating is that when you have a little bit of dirt, if you just scoop up some river water and you put it in a cup, it'll, eventually it will settle. But if you, if you shake it at all, what happens? It gets real murky, Right? I think someone just dry heaved in the back. It gets, real, it gets real, real murky. You can't really see through that at all. And, and for me, this is a little bit of how we approach life. When we are constantly stirred up, when we are constantly shaken, we are unclear, we are unfocused, and we can't really see the pathway forward. It feels as though everything is in a fog and, and we can't think straight. But what happens when we allow this jar to sit? Well, what happens is that over time, that sediment begins to settle down until you can start to see just a little bit more clearly through that water. And to me, this is David's invitation to us today to stop and to pause, to allow whatever is being stirred within you to settle, whatever is murkying the waters and mucking it all up to settle as you sit in silence before the Lord. To find strength in the silence. And not your strength, but to find his strength in the silence. And we see David write this pattern out before us as he's walking himself through this. And and in turn, he's inviting us in to experience the very same thing. To find strength in the silence and to find a settled trust in God. So as we look at this psalm, we're going to see this uh, unfold before us, and hopefully we're going to see a, a pathway forward for us to experience some settledness within our souls. Psalm 62 has a little heading at the top there. It says, To the choir master according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. This is another song of David uh, where it says, According to Jeduthun. Jeduthun is mentioned in 1 Chronicles 16.41 alongside some of David's uh, musical leaders. He's named next to He-Man who Dane had mentioned a few weeks ago. And so the idea here is that this is to the choir master with, uh, according to Jeduthun, he's put this to a tune, this Psalm of David, he's put this to a tune, he's led it in a particular way. And before we jump fully into this Psalm, there's, there's one other thing of note that I think is worth paying attention to because we've been looking at a, a number of Psalms throughout the summer and always within the Psalms, there's this one moment where David is asking God for something or he's pleading to God for something, I need this, would you show up like this? This is actually really interesting. There's there's no request from David in this psalm. It's really just an acknowledgement of who God is, who we are not, who he is not, who humanity is not, and then again, a reminder of just how great God is. It's this restoring himself and refocusing and resettling himself on the goodness of God and that he is trustworthy. And so in the the process of this psalm, we're going to see that David really uh, begins to contrast the steadiness of God uh, to the shakiness of humanity, and he invites us to trust. So verse 1, 
begins by saying, for God alone, that word alone there, we're going to see six different times. It's going to be translated a couple different ways, but it means truly or only. For God alone, my soul waits in silence, and from him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. For David, what this means to sit in silence before God is silence before God equals a settled trust in God. He's quiet before the Lord because he trusts the Lord. He trusts who God is. He doesn't need to fill that void, that gap with kind of that awkward chatter. He can just trust in the presence of God. So a silence before God equals a settled trust in God. And why would David have such a settled trust in God? Because from and in God, David knows that that's where his salvation is found. Salvation, that word that means rescue, that's where his redemption comes from. He's saying, God, you alone are my rock, you are my salvation, you are my fortress, you are my safe harbor, you are the space where I can rest. And pay attention to what he says there at the end of verse 2. He says, and I will not be greatly shaken. What is David acknowledging there? Well, he's, 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 he's going to be shaken, but not too great, right? Just a shimmy, not too much of a shake, because God is, is with him, and in God he trusts. But where does David begin this psalm, this prayer? Again, by saying, for God alone. For God truly and fully, completely, and in God alone, our souls find silence and rest. I like how one translation, the Christian Standard Bible, uh, says the first verse of this. It says, I am at rest in God alone. I am at rest in God alone. This is one of those passages we hear and we're like, that sounds great and I should believe that, but my life says everything to the contrary. But where do we find rest? Where do we find restoration? Again, we read that and we're like, yes, in God alone, I can find my rest. But where do we actually seek rest? Right? Where in, in the, the actual everyday moments of life do we seek rest when we feel like we are so under pressure and everything is coming around us? When the jar of our, our life is continually shaken and we, we feel the cloudiness and the murkiness and we're like, what is even floating in there that's disgusting and we're overwhelmed, where do we turn? Right? For some of us, we might just want to numb out and just watch Netflix and just, just hit, yeah, we're just going to keep watching the next episode and the next episode and the next episode and life can wait. Right? This is going to help me in this moment. Or others of us, right, we just try harder. We're like, I just got to catch up and so my to-do list now becomes my taskmaster and that becomes what dictates if I'm effective in life or not and I'm just going to try and get as much done as I can and I'm going to go hard at life. Still others just kind of hide out. Do you have any of those friends that like suddenly just go dark on text messages? Like they just kind of disappear for a while because life just got too overwhelming and they just had to kind of retreat and then they kind of find their way back in when they can and then if it becomes too much, they just go back out. Or do you just distract yourself? Right? You know the, the big things you should be about, but you just allow the little things to dictate everything because it's just easier to do. I'll tell you, that is, that is like my MO right there. It's like, I know what I need to get done, but you know what would be really good right now is that project that no one asked me to do. I'm going to go ahead and take care of that. I think that's going to be super important to no one, but I can, I'm just going to do that for a little while. Okay, And then I'll leave this over here, and then I'll just do that. Where do you go? When you feel the pressure of life, where do you turn? Do you, do you have a space where you actually feel like you can be at rest? Where you feel as though your to-do lists and your tasks and your pressure, your homework, your emails, people, your worries that they can't break in? Right? Even as I describe that, some of you are like, I would love to have a panic room like that. that I just lock myself into Maybe some of you are like, yeah, I do have that room. It's called the bathroom. It's the only door that locks in my house, right? And I just stay in there. <laughs> Except those of you who have kids, you know that that doesn't mean anything to your kids. And they'll just knock and knock and knock and knock. 
Do you have a space where you can go? Do you have a place where you can begin to, to allow the waters of your soul to settle? I unexpectedly, when we moved up here, found something that I, I had done earlier in life, but now I got back into because it was so easy. It was fishing. Man, it's fun. Even if you don't catch anything. Now, some of you are like, it's only fun if you catch something. I'm like, nope, just that line in the water is like so good. And I realized why I found that so engaging for me. Abraham Heschel, he was a, a, a rabbi. He said, if you work with your hands... Sabbath, rest with your mind. Meaning if you're constantly working on things, if you're a carpenter, then you should rest in something totally other than working with your hands and you should read a book. And if you are constantly working with your mind, then you should do something with your hands to, to rest in. And so often I am thinking of things, I'm writing things, I'm working on things, I'm stewing on things that my mind is always going. And so for me, when I suddenly get outdoors and I'm able just to throw that line in the water, all I'm thinking about is, is there a fish that's going to come get it? And I'm just like slowly bringing that back in. And the great part about it for me is that usually I'm doing that somewhere that's beautiful in the outdoors a few weeks back. There was a, a little reservoir I was at. And there was a tree that had fallen down. And it was big enough that I could just walk out on it. I was like walking out literally into the middle of the lake. I only had one little mishap. And I thought, man, if I fall right now, I hope someone's watching because that'd be funny. And I didn't. I made it. I just a little, little wooble. But at the end of that, I just sat out there just throwing a line. And I just found my heart rate lowering. But really, it wasn't about the fishing. It was about suddenly being very aware of my smallness compared to the creation of our creator and his goodness and it was like I was able to hear again in the midst of that. Now, David is saying, in the midst of the pressure coming around you, when, when life is coming at you, when people are coming at you, you need to pause and take moments of space before God. Where are you able to ever do that? Where are you able to be in silence before God? Because what David is saying here is that the only place you will find strength, you will find rest, is in God and in God alone. And so he says, I, I will not be greatly shaken. Remember, just a shimmy, not a full shake. I, I will not be tossed around so much because I'm trusting in God. And he says, here's the steadiness of God. And now he's going to compare that to the shakiness and to the shaking of his enemies. Verse 3, how long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. I love the imagery that he's using here. It's like they've been pushing on David so long that the foundations are giving way and he's just like that fence that you see in your backyard that's just leaning and you're just like waiting for the next big storm just to take it down, but you're like, I don't want to do anything about it. But then kids are out there pushing on him. You're like, don't do that. We got to make it last, right? That, that's where David's at. He's tottering. He's weakened, but that's not enough for this crew. They don't want him just weakened. They want him taken out, and it says in verse 4, they only, they truly and fully, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. David's talking about those who are surrounding him. They don't just want him wounded. They want him destroyed. And I feel like when we look at our culture today, we're not that far from this. Meaning like we're not satisfied with someone just getting knocked down or taken down a level. No, we want them taken out and we go for blood. And David's saying there's nothing there for you in that. He even goes so far to say they, they take pleasure in falsehood. They don't even care about the truth. They just care about their own narrative and what, what's going to feed their storyline. They, they just want to do what they are going to do. They're intent on destruction, and they're going to surround themselves with people that agree with them that they should be intent on destruction. The prophet Isaiah, he spoke to this in Isaiah 5.20. He says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, he would say something similar and then he'd say, there's a time that is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. 
I know, we read a passage like this, and you're like, that has no application to today. I don't even know what he's talking about, right? And some of you are reading it, and you're like, that hits a little close to home, right? David is reminding us to be pursuers of truth, not to be content with falsehood. And to be pursuers of truth, we must be constant in the word. We must be constantly coming before God himself, allowing his truth to be the guide for our standard of truth. Because when we've been shaken up, when we've been stirred up, it gets real cloudy and it's easy to lose our way and we'll start grabbing hold of whatever sounds best in the moment. But he continues on describing the, the shakiness of his enemies. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Selah. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. And probably each of us in this room has even either experienced this from someone we've interacted with or we know all too well how capable we are of this. Where we can be so nice with the handshake, oh, it's so good to see you, but inward we're like, why are you here? I was really hoping I wouldn't see you today. Yeah. We know what that looks like. And David is contrasting. He's saying, this is no way to live the way in which they are living. Uh, life, if you want real life, lasting life, restful, peaceful, and not like easy, but like peaceful in that you can fall asleep at night feeling good about what God is doing in your life, then that is found in God and in God alone. But the noise of our enemies, our detractors, our, our life can, can continue to shake up the jar against us, unsettling us, bringing us back to an unfocused, unclear, stirred up way of life. And so David, he, he contrasts these two. He's like, trust in God. That's where you should be. Don't be like these enemies that are just going for blood. But at the end of verse four, there's this one word that just gets thrown in there. It just says, Selah. And I love that David throws these little interludes in there for us that we can pause as we're reading through, that we don't just rush our way through these psalms, but that we actually stop and we pause and we reflect on what has just been said. He's bringing us to a, a point of question. Where are you finding rest? When you're stirred up or when people are stirring things up, where do you find rest? So I want you to pause just for a second and think for yourself when everything is shaking around you. When the waters become unclear, where are you able to be still? Where are you able to be still? Not where is your neighbor able to be still. Not where is your spouse able to be still. Where are you able to be still? Where can you pause? Where can you rest? Now David's going to continue on, and we're going to ask a few of these questions as we go. And I'd encourage you to really answer them honestly. We like to fool ourselves. Where am I able to find rest? Oh, I'm able to find rest here and there. Right? Now get concrete. Where are you actually able to find rest? When was the last time you felt at rest? When was the last time you were actually still? Write that out. Maybe it's like I have no recollection of when that was. So David, moving on, he's comparing, he's con contrasting. He's like, here's the shakiness of my enemies. Here's the goodness of God. And now he's going to come back to where he began with that very first line, verse 5. He says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. Sit and rest in silence before God. For my hope is from him. Here again, where is he pushing us? Where is he inviting us into? To stillness and silence. Two things that sound torturous to some of us in this room, like it's hard to sit still, it's hard to be quiet. And he's saying, come and sit still before the Lord, find your rest in him. 
Psalm 46.10 is a verse I go to often. It's actually often when I'm, I'm sitting before the Lord, I will pray this as just a prayer to quiet myself, just to be still and know that you are God, just to be still and know that you are God. Lord, would you help me to be still and to know that you are God, to recognize who you are, I need, I need that focus because my mind wants to go so many different ways. Lord, would you just help me to pause in this moment to be present to who you are? Isaiah would proclaim something similar. He says, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In returning to God and resting in him, you shall be rescued. In quietness and in trust shall, your, shall be your strength. Quietness and trust in the Lord, that will be your strength. Again, we're back to this idea that we began with, that silence before God equals a settled trust in God. And here David again is proclaiming where his hope comes from. Verse 6, he says, He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. He only, again, he fully, completely, he alone, he's truly my rock and my salvation. But notice what he says there. He says, he only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. Before, what was he saying? I shall not be greatly shaken. Just a little stir. But now he's like, I won't be shaken at all. His confidence is growing. Where it began with like a little shake, now he's like, no, I'm trusting in the one who's immovable. And when I'm at rest in you, I will not be shaken because you are the same yesterday, today, forevermore. You are with me, and in you I find strength. And he continues on, verse 7, on God rests my salvation and my glory, my, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. On God rests, meaning God is capable of carrying my salvation, my rescue. He can take care of that. I don't need to rescue myself. God can take care of that. And then he says, on God rests my salvation. He can take care of my rescue and my glory. Now, we, we read that and we think, my glory, like what's David getting at? Is he just trying to be humble in this moment, get out of the way, and like my glory is found in God's glory? But it's interesting, that word there for glory it has this connotation to it of, of weight. The glory of God is weighty, meaning if you were to drop a rock into this water, what would happen? That water would be displaced because the weight of that rock would displace it. God's glory is so weighty that when he shows up, it displaces everything in the room. It's weighty. And David's saying, my weight, my glory, my being, where does it find rest? In God. So on God rests my rescue, my salvation, and God rests my glory, my, my being. He can, he can hold me. He can handle all that I am dealing with. He's got me. And he's my mighty rock. He, he's not shifting or moving. He's my refuge, my safe harbor. And so David, again, is just proclaiming to us and proclaiming to himself as he's writing these words, this is who God is. So even though I am under pressure on all sides, I will keep my eyes fixed on him and I will find rest in him and he will carry me. He will rescue me. He will redeem me. And as we saw last week, we, we now see again that often when David talks around an internal praise, it leads to uh, an encouragement to communal praise. And so he takes what he's learning. He's now like, okay, now everybody with me now. Let's all enjoy this together. And in verse 8, he says, trust in him at all times, O people. Everyone around, trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. He's saying, this is what I've experienced. Now I want you to experience the same thing. Trust in him. Hide in him. Find rest in him at all times. As one theologian, Alec Moyer, says uh, that God is a, a God for all seasons and all experiences. So we can trust in him. And what did David say there? He said, pour out your heart before him. That we can pour out our hearts before God. That we can take whatever is unsettled within us and stirring and we can just give that to him. Have you ever had a conversation with someone 
where you realized after you were done talking that you're like, ooh, I think I just overshared. Right? Like the person in front of you just simply asked you, like, how's your day going? Right? And then 10 minutes later, you realize you've like spilled your guts out and everything that's happened, and they're like, hey, I'm just still waiting to take your order. You're like, oh, that's right. I came here for coffee, not counseling. David's saying you don't have to hold those things back. You don't have to temper what you're going to say to God. You don't have to be like, well, so I was thinking. You can just pour out your heart before him. He's not going to be surprised, and he can handle it. He can hold it. He can care for it. He can redeem it. He can rescue you from it. But he's got you. For God is a refuge, a safe haven for us. And then what does he say again there? That one word, selah to pause, to stop, to enjoy this interlude that he brings us, to take a brief moment to rest in what he just said, that we can trust in God at all times, we can pour out our hearts to him, and that God is truly a refuge for us. See, oftentimes what happens when we pause or we sit still too long or it gets too quiet around us, what's our inclination? Are you ever being honest? We just, oh, I'm just going to check my phone real quick, right? If you're in line by yourself, I don't want to have to talk to people in front of me or behind me. I'm going to look busy, and I'm just going to scroll. We, we occupy ourselves all the time. David is saying here in the midst of this psalm, say la, stop, pause, take this in. Rest on these truths just for a moment. When you feel the stir of the waters in you, when you feel the shake coming, don't go for lesser things. Don't doom scroll. Don't just go through your social media feed. Don't, don't just get on TikTok for hours. No, no, stop and pause and allow God to deal with the stuff that is stirring within your soul. So that in Him, you can begin to allow it to settle. So, so here's my second question for you. When you are overwhelmed, where do you turn to for help and answer or rest? Where do you turn? And, and I just, I'm just going to say this because, we, again, we have a tendency to do this. Uh, don't just give, like, the church answer. We know the right answer. I should be turning to God. But actually, where are you turning? That's the answer I want you to think through. Where, where am I turning? Where am I, where am I numbing myself out? Where am I rushing to? What am I, what am, where am I going for? I have a question. Well, Google, what do you say? You know, where, where are you turning for the answer? Because what David is encouraging us is to not skip a vital step. We too often see jumping to God as like when things are really desperate, then I'll bring it to him. David's like, no, start with him. Start there. Pause there. The last section of this psalm begins a contrast of humanity and who God is. So verse 9 says, Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of a high estate are a delusion. And the balance they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. I love this in so many ways that I don't. Because what's he saying here? That all life is but a breath. And that word for breath there is the Hebrew word hevel. It's a word that the, the author of Ecclesiastes uses when he says all of life is vanity, vanity. It's a vapor, it's a mist, it's fleeting. It's a breath that goes out, never to be caught again. And so David is saying those who are low, and those that we see as less than, and those who are high and seem so important, they're all the same. They're just a breath. They're just a breath. The things that are, are frustrating you, the things that are, are kind of growing outsized in your mind, the, the frustrations you have or the troubles that you are facing that you sit and stew on and just seem to shake everything up within you and that's all you can see is the murkiness of what they have to offer you. 
Now hear me out here. I'm not trying to belittle the things that we really face. There are lots of trials and things that we have coming at us that are hard, that are really hard. I go through our prayer list. I pray with some of you after service. You are experiencing some extreme hardships. And I also know that some of us feel like life is hard because we've allowed some things that are are not very big to actually define our experience of, of life. It's if I was just to take like a quick survey and and just say, okay, if you could go back one year ago today, what was your biggest frustration? What was your biggest challenge? Right, some of you right now, you like maybe you can jump back there and you're like, I'm still living it, right? Don't look at the person next to you. That's not kind, right? <laughs> but others of you are like, I I was uh, I don't I don't fully remember. But if you go back a year in that moment, that felt huge, it felt crippling, it felt overwhelming, but it's, it's, it's a, a breath. Again, I'm not trying to be like, just write out your pain, it's not a big deal. No, I understand that, but sometimes we allow things that shouldn't be our guides to guide us. We're allowing what is fleeting to shape us instead of allowing the eternal to guide us. And so David is going to drive us back to to who is our refuge, who is our rock, where do we find stillness of soul. Verse 10, put no trust in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. David is saying, don't put your trust in false things. Don't seek rest in what will keep you restless. Don't chase after things that are always eluding you or owning you or crippling you in your thinking and in your being. There's a, a song that's written under pressure. Anyone? David Bowie, Queen, right? You just play the bass line and everyone knows what it is, although some people are like, isn't that Vanilla Ice? You're like, no, 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 no. But Vanilla Ice was pretty good too. But that song, it was interesting in the way that they came about in their collaboration. And they're, they're singing about being under pressure, that everything is going on. And, and how are they co-writing that together? The stories behind the scenes is that they were, they were fighting and they were trying to create something together, two, two distinct personalities coming together, friction over that. And how are they coping with alcohol and cocaine, right? So in the moment of being under pressure, what were they, they seeking? They were seeking some out and this song that resonates with so many people, and their out was, was just drugs, just to deal with it, to mask it, to, to numb it. This is what David is saying here. Don't set your hopes on things that don't matter. Don't try and rob from somebody else. Don't try and take advantage of somebody else for your own good just so you feel better in the moment. And then he says something that's terrifying. If riches increase, is set not your heart on them. Don't say that's going to be my hope. Mike Tyson, uh, former heavyweight champion, had, had numerous run-ins with the law, spent three years in prison. I, I saw this interview with him, and he said the three years in prison were, were the best years of his life. And everyone in the room was like, what are you talking about? He said, I, I think sometimes uh, if God wants to punish someone, he gives them everything that they want because you can't handle it. He said, that was my experience. I had everything I wanted, and I couldn't handle it. David's saying here, in this moment, if riches increase, don't set your heart on them because just like the the trials, the tribulations, the things that you are chasing after, they are vapor, they are breath, they are fleeting. They're not lasting. They're great in the moment, but not for a lifetime. So do not seek rest in what will keep you restless. I love how Tim and Kathy Keller state this. They said, when we are in trouble, our souls chatter to us. We have to have this or we won't make it. This must happen, or all is lost. The assumption is that God alone will not be enough. Some other circumstance or condition or possession is necessary to be happy and secure. David, however, learned to tell his soul, I need only one thing to survive and thrive, and I have it. I need only God and his all-powerful fatherly love and care. Everything else is expendable. 
Again, we hear that and we say yes to that. We want that. But to live that out is much harder because we allow some other things to have hooks in our heart that pull on us. David is saying all these things are but a breath. Sure, at times they're a loud and blustering breath, but they're still just a breath when compared to God. And so he ends this passage with what feels like a proverb. He says, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this in verse 11. And the phrasing here is a a grammatical device that places an emphasis on what the author wants us to know. Uh, Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. And what does he want us to know? That power belongs to God and the Lord is steadfast in his love. David is ending here saying God is strong and God is kind. That word for steadfast, it's a word that's used throughout the Hebrew scriptures. It's a word that we can't really uh, capture well in the English language because it is so ripe with meaning. It is steadfast, loyal love. It is a pursuing love that's coming after us in so many ways that that it, it just lasts and it lingers. This is the steadfast love of God. For God is strong and God is kind. This is what David is is pointing us towards. And then he says this, for you will render, you God, will give to a man according to his work. That's, That's where he ends. You will render to a man according to his work. And what we hear in this is he's saying, God, you will give to us according to how we live. Now that can sound terrifying, can't it? Like, oh no, I've got to tip the scales in my favor. But we've got to remember that the Psalms, this collection of songs, there's a gateway, there's a, a first Psalm that, that sets the tone for where this, it, all of these songs are going. And it contrasts two ways of life, the righteous and the unrighteous. Those who pursue God and those who laugh at him and scoff him. And David here is saying, pursue righteousness. Be still before God. Chase after him. And in his kindness, he will chase after you. That's what he's pointing to. us. I love uh, one author says this, the profundity, the, the depth of religious truth expressed in this psalm consists in the very fact that the psalmist knows that to see through the eyes of God means to get to the root of all things, of men and, last but not least, of one's own self. And to see life without any camouflage or self-deception as it actually is in its unadorned truth. What Weiser is saying here is that when we begin to see through the eyes of God, when we allow ourselves to settle enough that this gets clear again and we can see as we are meant to see in relationship with God, not only will we see those around us more clearly, but more importantly, we're going to begin to see ourselves more clearly. And no camouflaging, no fooling yourself, no faking it. You're going to see the things that you need to get rid of in your life. You're going to see things as they actually are. We see with a focus, with a clarity, with an unstirred and uncluttered heart. And when we see through the eyes of God, we truly see. John Mark Comer, he makes this connection. That there's this moment in the life of Jesus where he's baptized, he comes up out of the water, he's led by the Spirit to go into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, he's going to be confronted by the adversary, by Satan. Battle royale taking place in the, the, the lonely, desolate place. And what has Jesus been doing for 40 days before this moment? He's been fasting. He's been alone with God. And so often we read this and we think, that's why the devil came, because Jesus was at his weakest point. No, Jesus has been alone with God for 40 days. His soul is settled. Everything is clear. Satan has no chance against Jesus in this moment. Stillness and quietness and aloneness and solitude with God is where we will find strength, not weakness. Because we allow him to speak to us. We allow him to settle our soul so we can better see clearly. We allow his truth to be loudest in our life because there's so much other noise that's coming at us. 
And so David is inviting us to participate in silence before God. And the question that we often ask when we come to end of a passage is, okay, that's great, but, but what do we do with this? But what I know is we can't just will ourselves to be at rest as much as we'd like to. I'm just going to rest harder. No, that doesn't work. When the disciples were on a boat with Jesus and the waves it were all around them, the storm was going, where was Jesus? He's asleep, right? Talk about being at peace, unshakable. And they're panicking. They're in the boat with him. They see him, and they're like, the waves are coming in. We're going to drown. What do they do? They wake him up, and what does Jesus do? He stands up, and he says, peace, be still, and everything goes quiet. See, this is the offer that Jesus is making to us still. You don't have to be afraid of the silence. What I mean by that is you don't have to be afraid of what is stirred in you within the silence. Because there's nothing in you that God cannot handle. When we are under pressure, the waters of our souls are stirred. They are are shaken. And often it is in the silence where we are confronted by our failure. When we're quiet with ourselves, we begin to hear our own voice louder. Uh, The accuser often comes with condemnation of who do you think you are, all the things that you have done wrong. But what we must remember is that when we are in silence, we are never alone. We are with God. And if still the thought of that is utterly overwhelming to you because the choices you've made, the wrongs you've done, then know this, that Jesus came that he may silence your condemnation and free you from your guilt. For all who call on him, will have new life in him, will have rest for their weary soul, will have forgiveness should we repent of the way in which we are going and come back to him and sit before him and allow him to truly settle our soul once and for all. Because in our silence before him and in those moments, we will find that his strength is sufficient. So here's what I want to encourage you to do this week. Start your day in silence before God. Don't start with your phone. Start your day in silence before God. Now, I know some of you, you do this already. Keep it up. Keep going after it. For some of you, this sounds terrifying. And so let me help you because these are some of the things I, I have to do. My mind goes a million different ways, and when I'm quiet, my mind gets real loud. And so I found it helpful at times to just even set a timer. It's almost like you're giving yourself permission. I'm not gonna check anything, do anything for this amount of time. And for some of you, that might just be starting with a minute, okay? And I say that because that's where I started, all right? Just start with a minute, quiet. Lord, I just, I just want to be still, and I want to know that you are God. I'm coming before you, and, I, and I, I feel the cloudiness of life, and I just need you to settle my soul, and so I'm just going to spend this time with you. And just begin a practice of being quiet before him. It's a practice you'll never outgrow. You actually might grow to enjoy it more as you spend more time with him. But it's it's necessary every day. Because by the time you do that in the morning and you get to the end of your day, you know your your head is filled with stuff. You've been shaken. You've been stirred. You've been all sorts of stuff has come in your way and you need to just sit again with him. So rest with him. Allow him to restore and to refresh you. And in our silence before God, may we find his strength. You pray with me. Father, we thank you for the invitation of this psalm to just be quiet and to rest in you. That no matter what comes our way, that we would sit in you. Lord, I know that there's many in here that are facing hard things that have disquieted their soul, that have stirred things up. And I pray, Lord, that you would meet them in those moments. That they would recognize that your strength is sufficient. And Father, as your word says, that we can trust in you at all times. We can pour out our hearts before you, for you are our refuge. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Father, we thank you for all that you have done, for all that you have accomplished, for the ways in which you've moved and met us within our own lives. And God, I I pray that we would sit still to see it, to experience your presence, to pay attention to who you are, and from a settled place of trust in you, to find strength to move through the everyday. God, we love you, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we leave from here, I uh, just want to encourage you. Uh, if you need prayer, we'll, we'll be down, and we'd love to talk with you. If you uh, are interested in coming out on Wednesday night to hear from Pastor Mac, I'd encourage you to be there. It'll be an uplifting time. But as we walk out, uh, may these words guide us. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. May you know this truth today and may you know that God is strong and he is kind. And may you experience his grace and may you know his peace. God bless you. We'll see you on Wednesday.